Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I am uh, Charlie, the lead pastor here, and uh, glad you're here. Impressed that you're here. Time change Sunday. Any of you get double points, I mean, especially if you're new. Uh, you don't get as many points as people who were here the first hour, but man, we're really glad that all, all of y'all are here. Um, um, I'm, I, uh, it's the first time, I, I need to say this, I mentioned on Facebook, like, this is the first time I've ever like, forgotten about, about time change. Like, it used to be pastors had to obsess about it. Because, you know, like, got to make sure that people know, people know, don't want people to show up later. Now, smartphones have taken care of it, and so now I completely, I completely forgot about it. And it really does, it's got me, it's got me off and a little rattled today. Did I introduce myself? I know I said, hi, I'm Charlie, by the way. If I didn't, I'm lead pastor, and it's going to be fun 30 minutes. Anyways, we're, we're starting a new series today in First Thessalonians, and it's got me thinking about, I really wish that I could go back in time and interview teenage Charlie um, because you know, as, as God is just kind of changing me and my perspective about church and who God's called us to be, and I think about kind of the church that we had. I mean, the people were really nice in, in some ways, and I enjoyed it in a lot of ways, but also some things about it that were just pretty unhealthy, um, just real, real harsh in a lot of ways, real restrictive in a lot of ways. I wouldn't say particularly um, healthy um, in kind of what it really means to have a, a balanced walk walk with Christ. We were having this problem today. It's all right. It's just one more thing to distract me when I'm mostly asleep anyways. Um, and and um, I, I wonder, I, I wonder if, if I could ask, let's say 13, 14-year-old Charlie, I could ask him, like, what do you think the point of all of this is? Why, why do we do this? Now, there are some questions that I asked about kind of what was going on here, and is this really true that you know, you weren't supposed to ask, but I don't even, I don't even know that I would have even considered asking this question. Like, what is the point? Like, wh- why, why do we do this? I mean, it was just so accepted. We, 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 we come to church every week, multiple times a week. We're in this building 10 hours a week. Why? Because that's what you do. But I don't really, I would never say that there was any point in which I was given anything close to a compelling vision for what the point of all of this was, where we were going, who I was supposed to be, what I was supposed to do. Well, you just, just do, just do. You come to the church and you don't do the bad things. That's it. And, and part of me wonders, man, that like, like even if we, you know, switch up church a little bit and we're a little more open, a little, a, 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 you know, a little less you know, legalistic with all the rules and the things. We, we take some of that out and you, we, you, you change the dynamics of it. Are we still in that same spot? Like if I were to say to you, man, like, like what's the point? Why, 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 do, why do we keep doing this? And if there's ever a day to ask that question, it's today, right? I mean, today is the day. Like it costs you something. It costs you something, right? Like, 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 what is the point? And sometimes I think, I, I fear that we don't have a great compelling vision for um, what does it really mean to walk with God? What is it, what is it I'm supposed to be about? And, and so we just kind of follow, oh, I believe that stuff, and so I come to church. I believe that stuff, so I read the Bible. I believe that stuff, but like, I don't have this great compelling idea about what it is I'm supposed to do and who it is I'm supposed to be. And so we kind of just stay kind of meh. And so what Paul has done in 1 Thessalonians, which is the book that we're about to study, is because of some things that are going on with them in their background, um, which uh, we'll talk about here in just a second, he he felt it was really important to really just kind of lay a foundation for them, to give them a real vision for what life was supposed to be about. A vision for growth, a a, a vision of like, this is who you are becoming. This is who you are becoming and why. But then also, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end. We're going to take this all the way through Easter. The last couple of weeks, he talks about um, what happens after you die. They're getting really kind of nervous about it, kind of thinking about it. And so that's what's going to kind of lead us into, into Easter. And so it's kind of divided up into a couple of parts where Paul is going to help us have a vision for growth, but then ultimately give us hope for the future. 
And so in order to really study one of these letters, really to do a good job, you kind of have to, I think it's good to at least do a little bit of background research to under, understand the people. And I, we'll just start with that, it's basics. Make sure everybody knows this, no one has to be embarrassed. The way these names come from, the, the book is called Thessalonians, that's the people. It's like, 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 like Britons, Americans, and so they come from, so they are Thessalonians and they come from the city of Thessalonica. And so, if you can find it in Acts, and you can here, and it's actually really helpful, you go to the book of Acts and you find out where Paul, uh, where Paul went to this town and kind of what happened and can kind of help you understand a little bit maybe what's going on with these people, what they're like, and maybe why Paul felt the need to write this letter. So, we're going to look at this in Acts chapter 17, 1 through 10. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. I'm I'm really in a weird spot right now. While I was reading, did the light get brighter that was on me? Did it? Anybody notice that? Like, I'm like really like, it's like, just felt like, I don't know. There's, I am, I'm off. All right, so here we go. So this is my favorite part of this, this passage that we're not really going to talk about is, is verse five where it says, some other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. Like, is that where they're like hanging out? Like, if you need to hire some ne'er-do-wells and some ruffians and hooligans, you just go down to the marketplace, you just round them up. Anyways, that's not what we're talking about today. So, So what Paul's doing here, this is kind of his normal routine. He goes to a town and first goes to the Jewish synagogue that would be there. And he'll go there and and try to talk to them because they're the people who would most clearly and easily understand the message of, you know, of, you know, that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the Jewish prophecy. And so he would kind of start with those people and kind of work his way out. So he was going there and talking about the fact that Jesus was, you know, was raised from the dead, you need to believe in him. And, but what happened was, and then typically what would happen is after about three years, he would establish his church, he would raise up some leaders, and when he felt like that they could be a little more self-sustaining, they, um, he, he would leave them and go to the next place. But this gets interrupted here in Thessalonica because while he's, while he's, while he's there, um, these people, again, they, they round up the ruffians and, 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 and ultimately, but for, for safety reasons, for Paul and for uh, the, the church, it's just fine the best that, that Paul and his friends, that they need to leave. He's got to, got, got to escort them out of town. And so his time with them gets cut short. And so what happens then is... Um, if you, if you think about it, it's like, well, well they're going to be, they're going to, one, they're going to feel a little awkward about that. They're like, this, this ended weird. They're going to be worried about Paul. Paul's going to be worried about them. Two, they're not going to be as fully grounded as they normally would be because Paul would have gotten an opportunity to establish them a little bit better. And then ultimately, they're going to be living with this persecution because the, the, the people that kicked Paul out of town aren't going to be real happy that there are still people there that are believing in this message. And so what we have in this letter um, is Paul, by and large, he, he's trying to reassure them, hey, we're good, I hope you're good. I, he's going to talk to them about suffering. He's like, hey, I know that that is rough to deal with sometimes. Hey, and he kind of gives you some tips on that. And also just try to help them uh, kind of get a little more established in some of the basic things that they need to understand that the Christian life is about. Which again, and why this is a great book for us if we're wanting to make sure that we've got this clear picture 
of what it really means to be a Christian. Not just to become a Christian, but to be a Christian. What is this life supposed to be about? And so, we'll look at um, kind of this, the, 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 the first part, 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, which is kind of Paul's greeting. And here's another, another tip. You're trying to figure out what Paul is, is writing about and why he's writing this. You go to Acts, you can find out a little bit about the church. But also, these greetings that we have, that if you've ever read some of Paul's letters, they all start to feel the same in some ways, where it's like, oh, Paul, he's an apostle who loves Jesus. Greetings, and we love you, and you're great, and Jesus is great, and isn't it all great, and you should believe in Jesus, and there's grace and faith and love and happiness and all this stuff, and he kind of goes on. But they're all actually very different, and they all kind of actually function as thesis statements, if you know what that is, academically minded people. It's kind of, he kind of is, is kind of introing in that all the topics that he's going to be talking about, and we'll see that here in 1 Thess 1, 1 to 10. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So you see in that some of the things we were talking about. He's trying to encourage them. Man, I'm so proud of you and your faith. You're doing a great job. I remember what you did and how great that was and that you're hanging in there. That's awesome. I know that you're suffering some persecution. I want you to stay encouraged because of that. And then, like I said, we're, talking, we're going to talk about that, they, that, that they're, they're, um, one of the things that they're anxious about, and we're going to see this in chapters um, 4 and 5, is they're anxious about what happens after death. And so that's going to kind of be, what, as we kind of get all the way to Easter, we're going to look at those last couple of chapters as we talk about, he gives this, this powerful, these powerful um, chapters on, on how we can have hope because of, of Jesus' resurrection. And, and so he, he mentions that here as well, verse 10. The weight, you know, that, that, verse 9, you can turn from God, turn to God to serve Him and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And so he's, he's like, hey, man, you, you guys are good. I'm so proud of you. Hang in there with the persecution. And you can trust in Jesus to, to, to save you not only in this life but the next, which kind of sets the table for the entire chapter, for the entire book. And so um, as he, he, in this, as he's trying to encourage them, and he's encouraging them based on what they've done and what he hears that they're doing, he kind of takes them to really kind of, I think, paints a really good picture of what a vision for Christian life is supposed to be. Because he talks about this progress that they went through. It's like, man, when, when we were there and we hear about what's going on with you, we're really excited because we see, and what he describes here is kind of a three-step process that he sees in them that I believe that ultimately God is wanting to see in all of our lives. And it begins... Verse 4, it's like, hey, we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Why does He know this? Three things, and we're going to see them one at a time. Verse 5, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. So the first thing that they did, which is the first thing that we need to make sure that we understand, that we need to do, is to receive the gospel with deep conviction. It says they received it with deep conviction. It also describes it as power. The Spirit was there, and there was power, and it was clear because of that and what we saw that you believe the gospel and you believe it deeply. You understood that when we talked to you about Jesus and that 
and that your sin has destroyed your relationship with God. And the only hope that you have, the only hope that you have is Jesus. And that his death on the cross is the way that you can be forgiven and restored in a relationship with God. You didn't just hear that and think, that's interesting. You didn't just hear that and say, look, I, I, th- I, think, I, I, think, I, I think I believe that. You heard that and, and, and with deep conviction, you now believe it. You believe it passionately. And so it, it, he says that we could, we could see it in your life that this is beginning to transform you. And so sometimes, I don't know if you've ever felt this, that sometimes like you'll, you'll hear somebody talk about how they became a Christian, like maybe you're reading a book or you hear somebody share a testimony somewhere and it just seems like it's completely overwhelming. It's like, you know, I had, I, I was, I'd, I'd committed murder and I was in jail and I was doing drugs all the time and this light opened up and this incredible thing happened and now, I, and, and now I'm a traveling missionary and, all the, and you're like, wow, it's impressive and you... And you buy the book, and you, and you and, and and it's and it's and it's epic, and and you think, man, I just I just got an ordinary story. And Paul's talking about, man, you guys, man, it was power, and the Holy Spirit was there, and you imagine this kind of this this epic thing. It's like sometimes you can get discouraged, like, man, I don't know, that was particularly epic like that. For some people, it is, but for some people, it's like some people are like, I, I think I started believing that when I was when I was a kid. Or it was really more just kind of a, a, a long-term process where it's like, you know, I was kind of exploring who I was and who God was, and I was talking to this person, I was going to church, and after a couple of months I realized, you know, I think I do. I think I, I, I know that I need Jesus, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to believe in Jesus. And you wouldn't necessarily describe it as the Holy Spirit showing up with power, even though the reality of it is that is exactly what happened. And and for our sake, the thing that we're talking about, I want it to be less about how epic the moment was versus how deep the conviction is. When I say Jesus Christ died for you and the only hope that you have in this world or the next is the death and resurrection of Jesus, how deeply do you believe that? Is that something? Well, you know, I mean, it's it's true. It's true. I, I believe that. I, I believed it for for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. No, no, no. The only hope that you have in this world or the next is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the relationship of God with God that you can have through Him. That's it. How deeply do you believe that? How 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 much is it really in there? Because I think sometimes, I think our struggle with really kind of getting to the next places in our walk with God and who it is He's calling us to be, overcoming sin, seeing, seeing the types of healings that we need in our own heart and in our relationships, these kinds of things. Because we don't, we don't start here with a deep, passionate conviction that I understand fully what Jesus Christ did for me and that is exclusively where my hope lies. Now, for me, it kind of happened in stages. And when people ask me about my relationship with God, I'll typically will tell three different stories that coincidentally happened six years apart. One, when I was six, and, um, you know, I, you know I, I think I f- first understood really what everybody was saying when they said Jesus died on the cross for me. And so I wanted to, to, to tell people that. And there was this process you were supposed to go through. I had to talk with the pastor first and I think it was like a theology quiz with the pastor to make sure that the kid really understands. And I was really good at quizzes. So I, I, I had all the right answers and I, I knew all the things. And I, I wanted to walk down the aisle and tell everybody which was next step and get baptized, which was the next step. And I did all that. And I believe that it was from a very genuine place. It's like this is as much as a six-year-old believes things, I believed it. I mean, but it was relatively shallow, but I would say deep for a six-year-old. And then I remember at the age of 12, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and for, and for un, really unknown reasons, except what spiritually what was happening with me, I was, just, I was afraid. I got real nervous and, I, and, 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 and death, I really began to start really thinking about what death would mean and who God really was and what sin really was. And I remember kind of being in this panic and I remember just reaching out to God and in this new way, just kind of this new deeper way, it's like, Jesus, I, I believe in you. 
and I want the hope and the life that you offer. And in an instant, I felt peace and fell immediately asleep. And then six years later, I'm 18, 19 years old, and um, I've talked about this story before, just being in college and really for the first time having somebody tell me, challenge me with this idea that um, Jesus wants my whole life. He's not just interested in my church attendance and my relative morality. He wants my life, and because of the gospel and what he did for me, he deserves that. And in, and in this process, so again, that, that happens over the course of 12 years, I, I, I gain this deeper and deeper conviction about what Jesus Christ dying for me in order to give me a relationship with God, a, a, a stronger, deeper conviction of what that means. And, 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 the, and the main way that that begins to see is you begin to see your life begin to change. And we see that as he's describing kind of what happens for them in this next stage. He says, you received the gospel with deep conviction. Verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Spirit. So not only did they receive the gospel with deep conviction, which we also need to do, they became imitators of Jesus, which is what we need to do. We need to receive the gospel with deep conviction and be an imitator of Jesus. But he says, like, not only did you receive the gospel, but we begin to look at you and we see, make, they're starting to act like we act. They're starting to act like Jesus. And they could tell that, like, they, they knew that what was happening then was genuine because their life began to reflect it. And so, again, as we think about what a vision for Christian living looks like, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, not only do I need to receive this gospel in a deep way, I also need to then, well, now my life needs to reflect this. I say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, I receive that with deep conviction. I'm, it, people will be able to look at you and say, that person kind of looks like Jesus. They, they act the way that Jesus acted. And so that's what Paul's complimenting them on. It's like it, became, it was very apparent to me that this was beginning to change the way that you live. He began to look like us. He began to look like Jesus. And at this point, I don't think he's talking about living a missionary life, you know, because that's kind of what, what Jesus did. He was kind of going from town to town, telling people, healing people, telling them about what it means to have a relationship with God. That's what Paul and his companions were doing. That's not what they were doing. They were still at home. So it really wasn't necessarily about that. I think what he is primarily talking about here is their character. And we'll see that as, as we see more and more what Paul is talking about in the rest of the book. He is, he's affirming to them, like, man, you guys have done a really good job in, in, in reflecting what, what the character of Jesus. And so if I were to say to you, and again, we'll see this as, Paul's kinda, as we keep going through this, through this book over the next few weeks. If I were to say to you, man, that person, they act like Jesus. What are the kinds of things that come to your mind? I think the first thing that has to come to your mind is the way that you love other people. I mean, Jesus passionately loved other people. He loved people who were unlovable. He loved people who were, who were out there. He loved people who you were supposed to hate, who you're supposed to, to, to not associate with. But Jesus showed love and compassion to everyone. And so when we think about what it would mean, okay, I want to receive the gospel with deep conviction. Now I want to be like Jesus... I think one of the primary things that that has to mean is that I am going to move out of selfishness and be someone who loves others well. And especially those who are on the margins of our society, whether it be uh, more of the great things, and I just I want to commend you the way Paul is commending them, the way that our church loves orphans and, and kids in the foster care system, families who... Are, 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 have, are in, in the foster care system who, who have lost kids through that and seeing families be reunited and loving on kids, bringing kids into our home. The number of kids that in our church that have been adopted over the last few years, it, it's, it's amazing. And, and, and I see that. And, and, and a heart and a desire to love and serve the poor and people who are, 
struggling with homelessness for a season. That that is what Jesus did. He looked at the people that for whatever reason, the society says are not lovable, and, and we love them. That's what God has called us to do. But there's also some character things that God has called us to as well. And we see those, and he's going to, again, he's going to talk about these things. Um, he talks about their love for each other, but he also talks a little bit about sexual morality. And so he's talking about them, the sexual morality, in part because in these towns in the Roman Empire, they just had very different standards and ideas about what sexuality was as opposed to what Paul did. And so we'll see that as a, as a theme all throughout Paul's letters. It seems like it always comes up. Hey, remember, we don't, you don't do that anymore. You have to bring your, sexu- your sexuality in line with God's principles. And if you look at Jesus, the thing that he seems to talk about the most is he seems to talk about finances. He seems to talk about, hey, man, you gotta get, if you're going to have a right relationship with God, you've got to get right with your finances and make sure that you're putting God above your money. And you you look at the New Testament, the two things of morality that seem to be most prominent often are those two things. Well, why is that? I think in part more than anything else, those are the things that really kind of strike at the core of who we are. Those are the things that are the most personal, the things that are the most private. So if I were to say to you right now, I tricked you. We're not really going to be talking about a vision for the future. We're not really going through First Thessalonians. We're going to spend the next several weeks, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about whether or not your sexual ethic matches up with God's and whether or not you're doing right with your money. Yay. Why, why, why are you already a little bit defensive? Why at the mention of sexuality, I just said the word sexuality, I'm like, <laughs> and money. <laughs> it, we get nervous. It's, it's too personal. It's too private. I just want to come to church. If I said, man, the key to Christian living is you set your alarm five minutes earlier and you recite a five-minute prayer. You're like, all right, all right. You need to come to church. All right, okay, that's good. I like that better. Like, it's like, listen, you've been telling me I need to work at Grove Kids, and I really haven't wanted to. To outwork Grove Kids. I'll do that. But don't start meddling in here with what's going on in my heart, with my money, with my sexuality. That's too personal. But that's what it means to receive the gospel with deep conviction. That's what it means to be an imitator of Christ. Not superficial things. And I think that's what I thought growing up. It's like, man, it was just about looking good on the outside. It's why we dressed up and it's why the biggest sins were the ones that people noticed. Not the ones that they didn't. Which leads us to the next stage. And so, you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from from you not only there your faith in God has become known everywhere and so they became imitators of Jesus and the next thing that happened is they became a model to the world around them suddenly everybody's taking notice I think my youth group man my church they kind of told me this is how it would work that if you lived for Jesus people would take note and want to follow him but it never really worked out the way that they talked about. It's like, if you don't drink, you don't go to parties, people will know and they'll want to they'll know about Jesus. It turns out they only just thought I was weird. But it actually does work. You start living a life like Jesus, you start imitating Jesus, and the world will take notice. This isn't a time where... This is a time where Getting a message to someone 45 minutes, 45 miles away, that took a lot of effort. And yet somehow, who they were and how they were living was, making, was being known all over the known world because they were living like Jesus. And people were hearing about it. It's like, you will not believe what is happening to those people. And again, it is because they are showing deep, loving concern 
for people, including those on the margins of life, because they are allowing Jesus not to just simply change some superficial aspects of the exterior of their behavior, but was changing the core of who they were, and they began living that out. And suddenly they're making a huge difference in this world. Now we say this from time to time, and we just keep saying it more and more and more, and I want you to hear it more and more and more. This is the vision for your life. I want to receive the gospel with great conviction. I want to start living like him, and then if I live like him, then the world will take note. And now I'm having an, an impact. I'm making a difference in the lives of people. And again, too often we think, you can make a difference in the lives of people. It's like, I don't know that I can. I'm not that, I'm not that talented. It's not about being talented. It's not about preaching. It's not about teaching. It's not about being a missionary. It is about you living a life that reflects Christ. That I'm going to live and be who he's called me to be. I'm going to love people the way he loved. And then I'm going to see it's just a natural consequence. But this is the vision that God has for your life. For you to be the kind of person that is a model for what it means to have a relationship with God. And as scary as that sounds, let's just break it down into the steps. I don't know that sounds scary. Well, how about instead of doing that, you just try to be more like Jesus. Be more like Jesus. That sounds a little intimidating too. Okay, how about you just work on believing the gospel with deep conviction? Because they lead to each other. Where if I really believe that the gospel is my only hope, then I will love and follow the one who gave that to me, Jesus. And the more and more I become like him, um, I'm just making a difference everywhere that I go. God is using me to bring hope and light and life to the people around me. So wherever are those stages that you feel like maybe you're just a little bit stuck in, let's just pray for each other that we would receive the gospel with deep conviction. We would be like Jesus and then ultimately be a model to the world that needs it. As always, we've got lots of ways to respond. Our prayer team would love to pray with you. There's communion available. There's prayer candles. We've got an opportunity to give. We're going to worship. But let's ask God to give us this vision, this vision for our life. And let us, let us all make a commitment to take whatever that next step is, to believe the gospel deeply, to imitate Jesus and to be a model for the world around us. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your son. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the hope that it gives us. And God, I pray that we would not view our walk with you, our participation in church, as just trying to change some of the things on the outside. The God that we would not view it as life coaching. But God that it would be uh, transformational. The God that we would believe the gospel and what your son did. God, we would believe it deeply. And God that would affect our lives not just on the outside but all the way to the core of who we are. And God I do pray that as you are remaking us that, God, that you would use us in the lives of people around us. Give us a vision for what that is. Give us deep conviction. And, God, help us be a church collectively and individually of people who are living that out. And it is always, it's always only because of your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.